So I'm an occupational and counselling psychologist, mainly an occupational psychologist, I would say. And people who come to see me come to talk about the problems they're experiencing at work. But before I launch into the main part of the lecture, I just want to do a very quick straw poll. Uh, and I'm wondering, actually, if very briefly the lights could go up for that. Uh, if they can't, it's fine. Um, what I'd like to know is how many of you in the course of, thank you, in the course of 2018 have gone to see your doctor? If you've been at any point in 2018 to see a GP, gone to A&E, uh, outpatient or even inpatient, could you please ra raise your hands? So let's look around the room. Thank you, you can put them down. I'm putting my hand up because I've definitely been to see the GP. So as we can see, the majority of people in the room, the majority of people in the room, at least once and perhaps more, have consulted a doctor. But doctors are important for me not only in my role as a patient, but also in my working life, because I'm a psychologist who specialises in, in supporting doctors. And these are the sorts of emails that ping into my inbox on a very regular basis. They're real emails. Uh, I've just taken out any identifying details, obviously. I'm in my third year of OBS and gynae training. I'm currently off work due to stress and considering changing specialty and or all taking a break from medicine altogether. Hello, I'm a junior doctor who's currently lost as to whether to stay in medicine or to leave. Something very sad about that. I'm a doctor with late diagnosed depression and ADHD, currently unemployed, having crashed out of clinical and academic medicine a while back due to a combination of cumulative life stresses, workplace bullying and previous inadequate mental health support. I'd appreciate advice on a career change. Houston, we have a problem. Or perhaps I should say Hancock we have a problem. That's Matt Hancock, the current Secretary of State for Health. So what's going on? Well, it might be very tempting to say, well, Caroline, obviously you see, you don't see a random selection of doctors. And of course that's true, because for each of us in the room, uh, we don't go to the doctor when we're well. We may go if we've recovered to, in order to be checked up, but when we initiate a contact with a doctor for whatever reason, we go because there's something wrong with us. And equally, doctors do not come banging on my door asking for help when they are loving their work. However, the volume of emails I receive, I think, indicates that this isn't, they're not outliers that I see, a tiny, tiny proportion of doctors. I think it's more than that. And also there have been studies like this one, which was carried out in 2016 by the Royal College of Physicians, being a junior doctor, experiences from the front line of the NHS. Interesting, front line, military vocab. So what did the survey find? It was 500 doctors. 80% felt the work sometimes or often caused them excessive stress. Not just stress, but excessive stress. Nearly one in five had to carry out a clinical task for which they had not been adequately trained. How does that make us feel as patients? A quarter felt that work had a serious impact on their mental health, and nearly half felt that poor, poor morale had a serious or extremely serious impact on patient safety. And I think that that final statistic, I've just pulled some from the report, reminds us that, of course, there's a moral issue about looking after our doctors adequately. But there's also, ultimately, this is an issue that, uh, that is relevant to everybody in the room, because we are all, at some time in our lives, likely to be patients, and unhappy doctors will be less good doctors. And there's further evidence of this. This is, a, this is just a summary chart from research, uh, a, a review of the literature on burnout, physician burnout, carried in, um, out in America. And on the one hand, the personal, you can see burnt out physicians are more likely to have broken relationships, alcohol, substance use, depression and suicide. Suicide are elevated amongst the medical professions, particularly amongst women. And then in terms of what, how that impacts on their professional life, uh, burnt out doctors are more likely to make errors and they're more likely to have unsatisfied patients, their productivity is reduced and they're more, there's more likely to be physician turnover. So it affects all of us ultimately, this issue. 
So what's going on? Well, yeah, I think that we all know about uh, issues in the NHS currently, and the King's Fund, one of the leading um, health think tanks, carries out four monitoring reports a year. And their last one looked at, and I imagine many people in the audience are familiar with this, sustained increases in patient demand, particularly from elderly patients. And elderly patients typically don't just present with one problem, they may have many problems. Delays in transferring patients from hospital to social care, and financial press pressures causing cuts to staffing. So what that means is, in a sense, you've got more demand and less resources to meet the demand. And maybe their Sun readers or Daily Mail readers, Guardian, Independent, Telegraph, don't know who's in the audience, but everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with these sorts of headlines. And obviously, the pressures the NHS are under are a key part of the issue of why the medical staff are feeling as they are. But in the lecture, I'm going to be arguing that it's not the whole point. It's not everything. And something else is going on. So why do I think it's not the whole story? Although I want to make it clear, I think it's a very big part of the story. I don't think it's the whole story because uh, reports of depression, elevated depression, anxiety and suicide, increased suicide rates have been in the literature for, uh, have been reported for 50 years. And during that time, the NHS has gone through different periods of feast and famine, but that has remained a constant. And secondly, I don't think that the pressures the NHS is under are the only reason, because we find similar results, similar stories and accounts of burnout, depression, elevated suicide in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, USA. Yet these countries have got very different healthcare systems. So it's this something else that I want to really look at in the lecture. So the title was Mind Dash the Gap, colon, What's Missing from Medical Training? And I think we can think about the title in various ways. Firstly, the gap between the advances in medical science on the one hand, which are extraordinary, and our understanding of the psychological demands of medical work, which I think has remained very basic, as I'm going to outline. But I also think we can think about the title in a different way, because mind dash the gap implies that it is the mind that is the gap the thing that gets overlooked in the methods we use both to select and to train the medical workforce. I'm not the only one to say this. So this was a quote from Making Doctors, a book that was written in the 90s by Simon Sinclair, who was a psychiatrist and a medical anthropologist. He was a consultant psychiatrist. Sadly, he died very young. For his uh, PhD fieldwork, he didn't go to Borneo or up the Amazon or Papua New Guinea. He looked at a tribe rather closer to home. He looked at medical students at UCL Medical School. Um, and when he says medicine, unlike the military, is not scientifically interested in its recruits' psychological experiences, either their individual morale or the esprit de corps of their groups, I think he's saying something very similar to what I've said in my book, except that I've given it rather cheekily uh, a term. I call it the, the psycholectomy. And the psycholectomy is the way that medical training can surgically excise considerations about, of, of the psyche from that training. And I now want to look at it in two areas, selection and uh, the transitions in medical training. So firstly, selection. This was a 2014 list uh, produced by the Medical Schools Council. It was produced because there was criticism, justifiable criticism, that selection into medical school used to be very opaque. And uh, if you came from a background and from a school where they hadn't really uh, prepared, they hadn't sent many people to medical school in the past, they really didn't know how best to prepare applicants. If we look at this, we can see a number of these, a number of these different characteristics are in fact deeply psychological, motivation to study medicine, insight into your weaknesses, insight into your health, ability to treat people with respect, resilience, empathy. Um, so it's not that psychological characteristics aren't there. The problem is how they're assessed. Well, we know what doesn't work. 
Um, so this quote comes from a paper in 2011, and it was the it was the output from an international conference on medical school selection, where they had experts from all over the world. There's not much evidence of the credibility of interviews, personal statements, and letters of reference. So they would look at interview scores, they followed them up to the end of medical school or beyond, and the scores on the interviews and the personal statements and the letters of reference, they do not map onto how well somebody does later. And that's why in the UK, 30 of the 37 undergraduate programmes in the UK no longer use these methods. So the overwhelming majority have got the message. Um, instead, they've switched to MMIs, multiple mini interviews. And what this process is, is, is that a very large hall in the medical school is divided into sort of little booths. And an applicant sit, sits outside the booth and is given some instructions about what's going to happen next. And then either they blow the whistle or they ring a bell. So it's, it's devised, it has to be very, very carefully um, managed, stage managed. And then the applicant moves into the booth and that next section is uh, the next task. Uh, they'll, go, they'll go through the next task. So empathy. How would you measure empathy? Um, these are real example, a real example. They, the applicant might be told, you have run over your neighbor's cat. I have not made this up. You have run over your neighbor's cat. Your, cat, your neighbor is very devoted to their cat. You have to go and speak to your neighbor as to what has happened. And the applicant will just be given a minute or so to read that. They haven't gone around London actually running over cats. The, the neighbor is played by an actor. And in the booth, there will be somebody like me or somebody from the medical school who is assessing that interaction. And I think you can see that's probably a better test, by no means a perfect test, but it's a better test than saying to somebody, um, tell us about a time when you've shown empathy, which can just be rehearsed and prepared. But the question, so MMIs are better than old style panel interviews, but the question of resilience, which is on the Medical School Council list, I think is an issue, is an area where certainly some of the doctors I see further down the line, uh, the question of their resilience for the demands of medicine is a key one. So how can we, how can we look at resilience? How could we test resilience? Well, it's not as if other occupations don't try to get a handle on resilience. If we look at the military, for example, particularly into special forces, we could look and see what they do. So a military blogger has described selection like this. The emphasis is on endurance and long dark hours, undertaking solitary, arduous, and often seemingly impossible and even pointless tasks. The instructor provides no encouragement or motivation to aspirants. Officers also undergo a special week of individual tasks, um, of determination and planning ability mixed with sleep, de sleep deprivation and diversionary tasks. Now, when we see about long, dark hours, solitary, arduous, seemingly impossible, sleep deprivation, actually, hand on heart, I could not say that some of those characteristics don't map on all too clearly with the descriptions junior doctors give me. So we could put medical school applicants through a week, which simulated the life of a first-year doctor, could be done. Uh, it would probably be a pretty effective way of weeding out those lacking in personal resilience. But of course, this is never going to happen. There are logistical questions why it's never going to happen. And also cultural questions. Whilst it's acceptable within the military that you need to push the applicants to the limit, and tragically sometimes in selection they push them beyond the limit, I think it would be completely unacceptable within the, quote, caring profession of medicine. Instead, we need another approach. We need a psychologically informed approach to selection. And in this psychologically informed approach, the dean on day one, he or she, would welcome the incoming class and say to the class that the majority of those in the audience, he'd congratulate them, all of them for getting into medical school, and say, for the majority of you in the audience, medicine is going to provide a rich, rewarding, noble, wonderful profession. But the dean would not stop there. He would then go on to say that if the students 
had doubts at any point, they would be able to discuss these doubts without prejudice with faculty within the medical school. And where necessary, they would be given support to find an alternative career pathway. And the dean wouldn't stop there. He would then go on to highlight that if faculty had doubts about them, they would be discussed and reviewed with the students. And again, where necessary, the students would be helped to switch career. Dream on. This is not what happens at all. Students are reluctant to talk to faculty because of anxieties about repercussions. If they do pluck up courage to go and talk to faculty, there's a tendency, an understandable but ultimately unhelpful tendency, for faculty to rush to reassure, oh, third years often feel this way, it's a really difficult transition, or oh, you're coming up to this set of exams, don't worry, it'll be better at the next stage. And they reassure, they don't listen. And if the student does persevere and, and really says, I'm not sure this is right for me, support services at the medical school can uh, have a, another gap in them. So on the one hand, there are the student counselling services where they have skilled practitioners for psychological well-being who do a fantastic job, but they really don't know about other careers. And on the other hand, they have skilled practitioners in the career service, but the career service don't have the psychological background and they don't, also don't have the time and the resources to be doing ongoing work, which is what it's going to entail. So if, when I see people who are thinking of leaving medicine, I would say six to eight hours across a number of sessions and you can make real progress. But the career service aren't funded to do that work. So, that's what happens when a student says, I'm not sure. What about when faculty think it's not right to them? But then we encounter a different problem. This is Jen Cleland, Professor Jen Cleland. She's, like me, a psychologist. Uh, she's at the University of Aberdeen Medical School. And she's one of the people who've talked about the failure to fail, how there is an endemic culture within medical school and nursing school and other healthcare professions where somehow it's not nice to fail people. And she has really questioned this, the ethics of supporting students to progress to the next stage of training, only to continue to perform poorly or at best questionable. It's also debatable whether scarce faculty resources should be used to support progression without improvement, which may take weak students further towards registration as potentially weak doctors. And I know I have colleagues in the audience here who, who are, are, are probably nodding and can think of students maybe that we've both uh, not medical students uh, junior doctors where that has been the case this is very dry stuff but it's not dry in fact there are often tears when the products of the failure to fail come banging on my door i've seen doctors who spent 10 to 12 years completing a five or six year degree medical degree only to find themselves unable to complete their first year but perhaps trying for three or four years to do so, at which point they can't get registered with a GMC, and after as much as 16 years, their medical career hits a brick roll. Can this be right? So I think we need to tackle the culture of medicine to shift towards my fantasy dean, allowing students to have a full and frank discussion with appropriately trained staff as to whether medicine's right for them, and also a, a counteracting the failure to fail. Because as I often say when I'm talking about this, it is inevitable that there will be students in a medical school class who are not suited for the profession of medicine. Because if that, the only way that that could not be the case would, would be if selection was 100% accurate. I don't know if there's anybody in the room who wants to take me on, on that question, but I think there's a huge literature suggesting that selection is not, and we will, everybody will know from their own experience. And secondly, it would be the only other way it could be medical school selection would be perfect would be if people don't change. Selection is imperfect. People do change. So there need to be methods both helping the students and helping the faculty to realign things better. So that's my first area. The second area uh, is uh, where's, where there's a glaring omission of psychological con uh, considerations is on this issue of transitions. And medical training could be regarded as a 10 to 20 year process of continual transitions. 
10 to 20 years. It's a very long time in my book. How could it take so long? So I'm going to try and see if I can get this to work. Yes, I can. Thank you, staff here at Gresham. This is a graphic that the Wales Deanery um, it came from Cardiff University in 2011. It's quite old. I've always wondered about it. It probably is the clearest way of explaining what is so complicated about uh, medical training. But I've always wondered why the man comes out of a manhole as a graphic. Do we really want him to be saying that, that, that you graduate from, you crawl out of a drain when you, when you come from medical school? I would have preferred doors, the doors opening as a, a metaphor, but anyway. Um, so... Med school is five or six years. Undergraduate medicine is five or six years. And about 90% of medical students go in and do it as their undergraduate first degree. Um, so five years, six years for about 30% of people if they add on an extra BSc degree. So five to six years there. Then F1 and F2, that's two years. Five to six plus two. And then we have, run, then we've got this block here. So let's have our man popping up and then popping up here, shall we? Um, so you can see that it's an incredibly long period of time, but actually it doesn't, it, for five to six years, two years, these blocks in the middle, GP is three years, but the other blocks are six to seven years as a minimum as a minimum. So you can easily be spending 15 to 17 years of full-time training. Just think about that, 15 to 17 years. We'll come on to the question of women and part-time training later. And in other specialties, it's a little bit more complicated because there is a, it's not one block, it's, there's a gap in between. And the implication there is that you have competitive entry between those two blocks and the numbers don't align. So they take many more people into core surgery than can continue after that competitive line between the two. And again, you may be thinking, oh, I have to get out of that one. You may be thinking too much information, but um, again, it's... There are tears and sorrow in the implications of some of these things, like you've spent five, six years in med school, two years in foundation, two years in core surgery, you've got all your postgraduate exams, but you're going to have to change. But I also think that this doesn't really give a good enough feeling of what's really going on, because in foundation, F1, you have three jobs. You rotate between three different jobs. In F2, you rotate between another three jobs. And so in those two years, they will have six different jobs. Probably in the same hospital. Could be they, they might go to GP or something in the second year or community placement. But six different jobs. Each time, you have to uh, get to know new colleagues, learn new ways of working, different IT systems, find a place in a new clinical team. And then when you get to this block here, and we're just, you can be relaxed, we don't, we're not going to go into the stuff around the side, you can have another, you can have four blocks, four different jobs in core surgery, six different jobs in higher surgery. You can, you can end up that somebody may have 16 different jobs during the postgraduate period. And I think this number of transitions is quite extraordinary. And I think it's hidden from patients. I don't think we as patients really know that the doctor we see in front of us may have had changed jobs 16 times over the last whatever years. And I also think the system of training is unaware of the impact of this, the disruption it causes, which is another example of my cyclectomy. And ooh, let me just do this. It's not as if there aren't data, though, that will alert us to the potential impact of transitions. So this is the Holmes and Ra stress scale, a well-known psychological measure, coming from studies of, of about 500 medical patients in the States in the 60s. It's old data, which looked at the links between all these different life events and your physical and mental health. 
and the research has been replicated in different countries and different populations. And the basic finding is that life events have a major impact on your physical and mental health. Now, it would probably surprise nobody that death of a spouse is the issue, which is, is the event which has the highest, most significant impact. Most of the doctors I see are in their 20s, 30s, occasionally early 40s, so it's been rare, but I have seen doctors who have tragically lost a partner. But some of the other elements from the list are things that happen every time a job a doctor changes a job, which, as we've seen, could be as much as 16 or 17 times over their postgraduate training. Change in number of family reunions, that might sound really odd, but actually I can relate from the stories doctors have told me to that. Stories of you can't go to your sister's wedding, you can't go to your parents' golden uh, silver wedding, or there's some family, family are visiting from another country and you can't go to meet with them. Because you may only get your rotor when you pitch up for, a, let's say, a a four-month block in foundation or a six-month block later on, and it may be fixed and you can't get leave on that time. And that has a huge effect on morale. So I think as well, so there's the something about the, the transitions itself that is under-recognised and under-thought through in terms of their impact. But we also need to realise, and again, I don't think that the systems of training and support inevitably do this, but we need to realise that the nature of the work inevitably, yes, inevitably, places huge demands on the psyche of each and every doctor. And I'll just give you two examples that have been told to me recently. I had an Obzengaini trainee who talked to me in my session about sewing up a woman after an emergency C-section in which the baby had died. And she talked about the experience of sewing up this woman whilst the upper part of this woman's body was convulsed with sobs. Another story told to me, a woman, a haematology trainee, hearing a woman in the next door ward howl like a dog when she's told that her bone marrow transplant has failed and there's nothing more that can be done to treat her leukaemia. The patient has two young children. She's screaming that they can't be left without a mother. Now, these are two harrowing examples, and the doctors who recounted them, of course, they also had very different examples where babies were saved and bone marrow transplants were successful. But even with good outcomes, the psychological pressures on doctors remain intense. They constantly have to make decisions which can have hideous consequences if they get them wrong. And I often think about that. You know, if I, if I had forgotten my notes today, or if I went blank, what would happen? It wouldn't do my professional reputation very much good, but nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to be seriously injured. So doctors live in fear of making a mistake, being complained about, a fear which has only increased since this case. Um, this is Dr. Hadiza Bawagaba, who was a UK medical graduate, trained at medical, Leicester Medical School, and doing her pediatric training, uh, at Leicester, uh, her, her pediatric training at Leicester Royal Infirmary. In 2011, she was involved in a case where, tragically, a six-year-old boy, Jack Adcock, lost his life. She was subsequently convicted of gross negligence manslaughter, along with a nurse, although she was given a suspended sentence, so she didn't actually go to prison. A subsequent fitness to practice panel did not strike her off as they recognised the numerous failures in the system, which included she was on a 12-hour shift with no break. The consultant who should have been there was off-site. He'd made a mistake with his diary. He, she was doing the job of two registrars because they'd failed to appoint another one. She was covering six wards across four floors. The IT system wasn't working. And she'd just returned after 14 months maternity leave with inadequate induction. That's why I say, for these sorts of reasons, why the military parallel uh, has some relevance. The fitness to practice panel's decision was then overturned by the G GMC, and she was erased, what a terrible word, erased from the medical register. <laughs> 
Junior doctors around the country were so incensed as to how their colleague had been treated that they crowdfunded legal fees, which enabled her to appeal. Her appeal was successful, and she's been allowed to continue practicing as a doctor. So medical work is hard work. But I have argued in this lecture that the, select, the systems of selection and training overprivilege one form of hardness, the volume and complexity of medical science, at the expense of another, the emotional demands of being a doctor. When it comes to the developed world, doctors, by and large, are protected from acquiring infectious diseases from their patients. But this wasn't always the case. Just round the corner from here, is in Postman's Park, um, there is a plaque to William Freer Lucas, who was only 23 when he died. He was administering chloroform, a chloroform anaesthetic, that's how anaesthetics were, the, sort of the nature of anaesthetics. Um, and during, uh, to a, a patient, a child, who had, uh, was being given a tracheotomy because they had diphtheria and the child couldn't breathe. The child coughed, uh, Lucas, caught diphtheria, and 10 days later, he died of the disease. More recently, I think we have become aware that doctors run the risk of catching infection of diseases from their patients in the Ebola crisis. Um, we got used to, in our, in our TV screen, seeing these sorts of pictures from the outbreak in West Africa. There's another outbreak currently. But mercifully, for us in the developed world, transmission of infection from the patient to the doctor is rare. But the intention, just look at how that level of protection, but the attention given to the transmission of harm from infective agents isn't matched by a similar level of concern about protecting doctors from the transmission of psychological harm from a patient or their relatives to the doctor. Yet caring for somebody in distress is not and never will be an emotionally neutral task. When we care for others, we draw upon our own experience of being cared for in the past. Or more technically, we might say we draw upon our own attachments to our primary carers. Gwen Adshead, a forensic psychiatrist and former Gresham professor of physics, has given a beautiful description of how this works. Early attachment to your primary caregiver becomes representative, co represented cognitively in the brain as an internal working model, a complex schema of images, beliefs, and attitudes towards attachment relationships. The caregiver icon, she calls this complex schema, the caregiver icon, which is engaged psychologically when the individual is either in need of care or has to provide it. In other words, how we were cared for when we were infants gets encoded in our brain and it influences our own capacity to care for others when they too are very vulnerable. Now there isn't a huge literature looking at the relationship between the attachment styles of doctors and how this influences their capacity to care for patients. But there is some growing literature of studies from other healthcare professionals. So, for example, there's a study, a Canadian study of ambulance workers that found following a critical incident, those with secure attachment styles experienced less distress and also recovered more quickly. So if they've had to go to a particularly challenging and harrowing road traffic accident or something like that. In large part, those with secure attachment styles experience less distress and recover more quickly because they were more likely to access support from those around them, which makes sense. If you've grown up in in from infancy believing that those around you will care for you when you need it, you're much more likely to go seeking help than if you've grown up with the experience that actually nobody cares for you and you're on your own. But of course the support has to be there. And there has to be somebody whom you know, trust and respect to whom you can turn. Moving every four months or six months, six months or every year over a 15 to 20 year period makes it all the more likely that there is nobody there, even if you are securely attached, even if you have no problems asking, it makes it more likely that there's nobody there for the doctors when they most need it. I don't 
want to fall into the trap of looking back at the past with rose-tinted spectacles. But I do think we need to acknowledge some of the things that make it harder nowadays to train as a doctor than it did in previous generations. Now, admittedly now, doctors work shorter hours. The maximum in the UK is 48 hours a week. In the US, it's 80 hours a week, and that's regarded as a great um, triumph because it was previously, it's the 80-hour reduction. Um, so doctors now work shorter hours, and this is a good thing because it reduces fatigue-induced errors. There's a large literature on that. And it also reduces the risk of crashing the car on the drive back home after a night shift. And I have had a client who walked in front of a who was so tired and sustained um, a, a brain injury that meant that she had to leave medicine, and it was tragic. But there are other factors that increase the feeling of being alone. Medical, the medical schools are much bigger. Um, if we think locally, we're near to Barts. It, previously, Barts was a medical school, St Bartholomew's Hospital, and the Royal London. Now it's one. So they can start that feeling of isolation. They can get lost in medical school. Doctors used to do their first job in the hospital very near to where they had gone to medical school. Now they move all over the country for those two foundation years. And for perverse reasons, I'm happy to explain if anybody wants to know, the weakest doctors are likely to get sent furthest away from where they want to be. Even if they end up with somebody from their medical school on the foundation, they may never have met them because medical schools are so large. In their first year of practice, they don't live on site. Many hospitals, not all, but many hospitals have done away with the mess where doctors could go and talk through things and get some support. They move six times during foundation. Because of working hours restrictions, which are good, the old style firm has had no longer exist, not so good. And it's been replaced with a shift system with no thought of any ways of providing some continuity for those doctors. These things happen to each and every doctor, but there are other groups who face additional stresses. 55% in the UK of medical students are now women. In the UK, as opposed to the US, they can opt to train part-time, but just think about it. If full-time training takes 15 years or more, what does that mean for women who take time out for maternity leave and then return part-time? It means, amongst, it means many things, but building up close networks of support can be really difficult for these women. And support when one returns to work is often woeful, which is exactly what happened to Dr. Bawagaba. Then there's the issue of medical graduates. Our healthcare system is in completely dependent on these doctors. The latest figures from the GMC show that 39% of doctors on the medical register are international medical graduates. They did not get their primary medical qualification in the UK or the um, EU. About 90% of these doctors are from BME, black, uh, black minority ethnic backgrounds. Just imagine, just imagine the horror for a moment if the Nigel Farages of the world got their way and these doctors were not able to work in the NHS. But there are many reasons why international medical graduates can find themselves even more isolated. They're often moving around the country before they get a training post, taking short-term jobs that other doctors don't want. They may be working in places with few other doctors from their home country. Family and friends may be in other countries, certainly in the case of some Iraqi doctors, for example, I've seen they knew their families were experiencing a cousin had been kidnapped, an uncle had been murdered, goodness knows what else is going on. There are cultural or language issues which make it harder for these doctors to build social networks. They're more likely to experience complaints. They may be on the receiving end of subtle or even not so subtle overt racism. And tragically, some of these factors also apply to UK medical graduates from BME backgrounds. Where do we go from here? I think the present level of distress is clearly unsustainable. And I think that the general public is waking up to this. As I've argued throughout the lecture, whilst putting the NHS on a sustainable financial footing would undoubtedly improve things significantly, I don't think that in itself is the complete answer. Instead, I think there needs to be a change where we start to give much more attention to the psychological well-being of the medical workforce. It's an uphill task. But there are some small signs that change is afoot. 
I'm really inspired by HALT, which is a campaign spearheaded by the indomitable Michael Farker, who's a paediatric sleep medicine specialist at the Evelina Hospital, the paediatric bit of St. Thomas's Hospital here in London. It st stands for hungry, angry, late, tired. And the whole campaign is ensuring that clinical staff, doctors and nurses who work through the night and anybody else who's working through the night get adequate rest. And his campaign is predicated on the basic notion that doctors and nurses, like their patients, are also human and therefore need sleep if they're to cope with the cognitive and emotional demands of work. And it's a rare example where doctors start to use their clinical knowledge, not only for their patients, but also for themselves and their colleagues. And for that, I think it's excellent. And it would be wonderful if, if psychiatrists and all sorts of other specialties were able to be looking not only at their patients, but also at themselves and their colleagues. There's the Point of Care Foundation, which is overseeing the development of Schwartz Centre Rounds in the UK. And these are hour-long meetings for staff across the hospital. But what makes them unique is uh, they're confidential meetings, but everybody's invited. The porter, the cleaner, the receptionist, everybody is invited. And they're not discussing, obviously, they're not discussing clinical, you know, latest clinical trials or clinical evidence. They're discussing the emotional and ethical issues that uh, arise in the day-to-day -day work of working in a hospital. And they are now well embedded. They started in America. They've spread all over the world. They're well embedded in the UK. And they're starting to be used for medical students because, of course, medical students can see and hear very, very difficult things as part of their training. And they're also starting to pioneer them in GP settings as well. There's a much needed development of two services, the Practitioner Health Programme, DocHealth, that primarily before were only for London and the South East, and now they're offering support uh, for doctors across the UK. And that is a great development. I'm also aware, because I've done some talks uh, linked to the book with Christy Watson, who's a nurse, that these sorts of services are not available for nurses. And everything, you know, it, that can't be right either. Not everything applies to, like, to doctors for the nurses. They're not identical, but many of the issues do. I began with emails, and I'll end with just one more. I'm not sure I will survive working as a doctor. I'm worried that I would get so stressed, anxious, and depressed that I would end up either hurting someone else by accident or more likely drive myself to the edge. I'm sorry if this comes across quite melodramatic. I really have reached crisis point, though, and I'm in desperate need for some sane input. This was an email I received uh, in about April and May of last year from somebody who was coming up to medical school finals. I didn't know him. He found uh, the, organize, the, the service that I provide on the web. Um, and this was not an email to ignore. And I was in Washington to visit one of my children. And once my granddaughter had gone to bed, I sat down and I wrote a long email to this guy and I told him to go and see his GP and student counselling and talk to his tutor and we then engaged in email correspondence and I talked to him as soon as I got back to London and uh, he, he, was on a, he, was, he was feeling much better by that time. He did go and talk to various people. I've subsequently seen him to think about what he might want to do after, in, after foundation. He's, he's halfway through his second foundation year. But I consider it a disgrace, actually, that somebody has to be sending these sorts of emails randomly. I might not have picked it up. And um, my hope is that the shift in the culture of medicine will mean that desperate medical students and desperate doctors won't be reaching out to me, an unknown psychologist, in the hope that somebody out there will listen. But that is only going to happen if we plug the app and we put considerations about the doctor's psyche exactly where they belong, which is at the heart of medical training. Thank you.